The story has been told of two farm boys who were having a discussion between them as to whose barn perhaps had the most rats underneath it. And so they went to the first farm boy's uh, place and, and that boy put a stick underneath the barn and, and shook it violently and rats just went everywhere. And so then they went to the other boy's farm and he also, that boy, shook a stick underneath his barn, and rats just went everywhere. And he asked his friend, did you see that? That was more rats. And his friend says, no, I didn't see a one. And so he says, well, well watch again. And he shook the stick violently underneath the, the barn, and rats just went everywhere. And he says, did you see that? And he said, no, no I didn't see a single rat. And so he says, well, let me do it one more time, and, and you watch. And so he, he shook the stick violently underneath the barn, and looked at his friend, and his friend had his hands over his eyes, so he definitely, or obviously, uh, and truthfully, did not see a single rat. He did not want to see. And as we consider the scene that we've been noting in John chapter 9, the man who was born blind, who was given his sight by Jesus, we see that there were those who just wouldn't see regardless of the proofs. There were those who just did not want to see Jesus for who he was. And, and so we're looking at spiritual blindness here. Here Jesus seemed to console in, on the scene of these verses before us as we bring this chapter to an end. Um, uh, an out, he's consoling an outcast sheep, the man who had been born blind, while rebuking the false shepherds, the Jewish leaders that were, were there. And it, incidentally, uh, Lord willing, we will begin looking at John chapter 10 next week where we read of the, the good shepherd and his sheep. For the man who had been born blind, the physical cure led to spiritual enlightenment. And so we begin here as Jesus was revealed more fully to the man who was once blind, as we read in, in John chapter 9, 35 to 38, as Jesus heard what had happened to him. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus heard what had happened to him, that he'd been cast out by the Jewish leaders. Remember, we have a Lord that understands rejection. It was even prophesied about our Lord in Isaiah 53, 3, where we read, he was despised <coughs> and rejected by man a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Despised and rejected. Oh, we see that coming true, that prophecy fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus. But the text indicates here that Jesus sought him out as he has heard this. And his question to him is, do you believe? And the you is, is emphatic there as seeming in great contrast to where he was and, and where the Jewish leaders were who had questioned and examined this man and even calling in uh, his, his, his parents. The man's response was, who is he? Yeah, perhaps requesting that Jesus, you'll point out this, this son of man that he is referring to. Remember, you know, he was blind when he had this encounter with Jesus. And, and so, though he had heard his voice and maybe had heard of Jesus, his eyes had not seen Jesus in that earlier encounter. But what he had come to believe was, as we noted in, in verse, uh, verse 11, that he, uh, the man called Jesus, and then in verse 17 referred to him as he is a prophet, and verse 33 acknowledging that, 
that Jesus had to have come from God to have done what he had, what he had done. Uh, but then in verse 38, we see here, Lord, I believe. Jesus tells him, I am he. It is he who is speaking uh, to you. Remember the woman at the well. When Jesus had his encounter with her and as the disciples had come back from, from Sychar where they had gone to, to get food, there Jesus, as he had revealed himself uh, to the, the woman at the well, had said, I who speak to you am he. And at that point, she left her water jar and went back into the city of Sychar to tell the people there. Uh, all that Jesus had revealed to her, and, and be, then the crowd, uh, the people from the town, came out to see Jesus. But the man says, Lord, I, I believe, as he had been uh, before physically um, able to see. Now he could say, I was blind, but now I see even spiritually. Oh, the sight he beheld. You know, he, G this man accepted the truth of Jesus' statement at once. We don't see any hesitation here, just like there had been no hesitation in going to the pool of, of Siloam to wash after Jesus had put the mud on his eyes. This, to this man, the only conclusion was that, that Jesus must be what or who he declared himself to be. And, and we, we might see within this man uh, faith that was a, a spark or faith that was smoldering. And now it has burst into flame as he joyfully believes in Jesus. And as Jesus continues this conversation with this, this man... Jesus states a purpose in his coming. Yes, we understand from the scriptures, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He, he didn't come to condemn, but he came to, uh, to, to save and, and, and to bring life. But yet, there's also judgment that was associated just within his presence. As Jesus says here, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. His very presence pronounced a judgment that revealed the hearts of those who encountered Jesus. You know, without pointing a finger, there were distinctions that were made. True light doing just what light does, exposes and, and reveals. In encountering Jesus, in, in seeing the miracles, and, and in hearing his teaching, hearts were just naturally revealed as to what their true nature was. And it is the same today in view of what the scriptures declare about Jesus. This was merely the result of his, his holy essence and truth. It was a spontaneous judgment. Heart after heart struck as they witnessed this man, Jesus, who needed to be acknowledged as the Savior of the world. His very presence provided a judgment or provided a distinguishing. In his interaction with the Jewish leaders, there, there was a revealing of their true heart condition. The effect of his life and teaching revealed every man's true condition. You know, and to me, it's quite interesting how the same acts can have opposite effects on people. And that just shows the distinction of the heart, whether the heart is open or the heart is, is hardened against those realities. Perhaps this is why the cured man found the ruler's disbelief so remarkable when, he see, when it seemed so clear to him of who Jesus has to be, that he had to have come from God, and yet they would not believe. The miracle excited attention, wonder, and and discussion amongst others. And they were divided, as we noted last week, even the leaders were divided. Perhaps this is, uh, and, and, uh, and it revealed the true condition of their hearts. Your responsibility and opportunity increased by Jesus' life and teaching in the presence of the Jews. False and true were tested. And so there was a spontaneous judgment. It just happened. But there was a verdict here that was self-enacted. Those who were in the darkness of ignorance, as they groped to see, were enabled 
to see. But those who claimed to be enlightened were left in darkness because they closed their own eyes, they closed their own hearts to the truth of Jesus. The judgment was thus brought upon themselves. And someone has noted, you know, in looking to Jesus, uh, for the one who looks to Jesus, if he sees in Jesus nothing to desire, nothing to admire, nothing to love, then he has condemned himself. If he sees in Jesus something to wonder at, something to respond to, and something to reach out to, then that man is on his way to God. What is the heart open to? We need to even consider our own heart condition. And so Jesus notes the blind seeing and, and the seeing being blinded. You know, some outgrew comprehension or, or understanding, it, 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 it seems. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty five 25 to 26, uh, in light of the things that Jesus was, was doing, and, and there were those who were readily accepting and those who quickly rejected Jesus, we read here, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Amazing statement there. Those who claim to have the key to knowledge you know, it, it is possible for them to develop such a mindset that cannot see the truth when it is clearly revealed. Hidden from wise and understanding and revealed to little children, Jesus' pleasure was, was to make the message simple for those who would accept. And we need simple faith that runs deep. You know, there, there are many in this world who say, oh, religion's a crutch. I've outgrown religion. You know, they, they have no need for God. They have no need uh, for Jesus. Oh, we need to have the faith of a child, the trust of a child, the innocence of a child, and the openness and the intrigue of a child in acknowledging Jesus for who he truly is. You know, some want to teach while they remain unteachable. In a sense, that marked the Jewish leaders that Jesus encountered in this situation with the man who was healed blind. And that he, that the man, encountered himself as he was questioned by them. Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 2 and verses 17 to 24 where we read, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Those who were teaching others and thinking they were in that, that position, but they were not open to the teaching themselves, taking it to heart themselves. You know, when we're, we're, we're pointing out that which may be wrong in, in the life of, of another, we need to recognize in the pointing, how many fingers are pointing back at, at ourselves, we also must be open to the same things. And as we are making changes in our life, we are surrendering to the truth of God's word. Those we're reaching out to will also be more open to that teaching when they see the effort that we are making in our own life to accept and to implement the truth of God's word. Some who saw themselves as leaders of the blind were themselves blind guides. You see, Paul uses the expression uh, himself here, just as Jesus did. And in Matthew 15, 14, you know, there we find Jesus as the disciples uh, note some of the Jewish leaders, and, and Jesus tells the disciples, let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind leave the blind, both will fall into the pit. 
And then even in Matthew 23, that, that woe, the list of woes against the leaders of, of the Jews in, in verses 16, 24, and 26. Again, there we have the reference to blind guides. Well, some of the Pharisees got pricked by Jesus' point as they overheard this interaction with the man who had been given his sight. Verses 40 to 41, we read, Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see your guilt remains. They caught the drift of his declaration. Hearing, they asked, are we also blind? But we ought to think also, would they listen? Were they also deaf? They also had a hardness of heart. It's a heart issue between the, the blindness and the unwillingness to listen. And though they caught his point, it seems that they refused to assign it to themselves. But Jesus' response, we see that if blind, then there is no guilt. The man who had been blind was not so because of sin as some had exposed. Remember that discussion beginning with the disciples at the beginning of John chapter 9. Uh, it has been noted that if one is truly powerless to do something, he can't be held guilty for not doing it. But if one brings the powerlessness upon themselves, they can't plead it as an excuse. And spiritually speaking, this is where these Jewish leaders were. Since they claimed the ability, the guilt remained. Are we also blind? Jesus' declaration is kind of in, in the vein of, you got it. You know, if the shoe fits, wear it. It did apply to them. The claim rooted them in their guilt. They had the opportunities, great opportunities for seeing and, and coming to understand, but refused to see the truth. And therefore, it was self-inflicted blindness on their part because they willfully refused to see. Even in their investigation, of this man's blindness is revealed a search for, for any way that they could deny the testimony centered on Jesus. First, trying to deny that a miracle happened by calling the parents in uh, to try to confirm, though, no, he'd not been born blind, but that didn't work. And, and continuing to question him, they could not undermine this man's faith and where it was, was going. And so they were angered at him and cast him out. The Pharisees were not ignorant of Jesus' character or works. As one commentator states, he bore all the marks of a prophet and more than a prophet. He spake as never man spake, and they knew it. He healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead, cast out devils, and they knew it. You see, they... they could not deny the miracles. And, and even when Jesus was healing on, on the Sabbath, they, they wouldn't deny the miracle just to tell the people, come on a different day and try to accuse Jesus based on breaking the Sabbath law by healing on the Sabbath. Jesus' life was completely consistent with his teaching, which again was a great contrast with many of the Jewish leaders of the day. But they closed their eyes to this great light of life that was, in effect, exposing their hearts and exposing their lives. The more they probed, it seems the brighter Jesus appeared, and people were witnessing that. And because of that, people were turning their faith to Jesus. This left them in the darkness of their anger. They were a witness against themselves. They were solely responsible for their blindness. They continued to ask for signs, but they wouldn't believe the miracles. They would not believe the signs that Jesus gave. And as a, another commentator writes, the man who is conscious of his own blindness and who longs to see better and to know better is the man whose eyes can be opened and who can be led more and more deeply into the truth. The man who thinks he knows it all, the man who does not realize that he cannot see, 
is the man who is truly blind and who is beyond hope and help. Biblical prophecy was definitely at work in the scene that we have looked at here in John chapter 9. Jesus fit the prophecies, and though many of the Jewish leaders rejected those truths and that reality, there were many others among the people who did accept. As Jesus fit the prophecies, as we know in, in Luke 4, 17 to 21, as Jesus' ministry was beginning, and, and there he was in the temple, and we read, of the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. And I would interject there both physically and spiritually. And recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus clearly acknowledging that prophecy related to him and his earthly ministry. And in Luke chapter 7, 22 to 23, here, when John the Baptist's disciples had been sent to Jesus because John was in, in prison and, and seeking, confirming who Jesus is, there we read Jesus' response to them. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus fulfilling prophecy. The teachers of the law and prophets should have said, hey, th this is him. In the midst of his glorious presence, they just could not see. But their, re their refusal also fulfilled prophecy. As John noted in his gospel, here in, in following the scenes of Jesus and following the raising of, of Lazarus from the dead and, and the Jewish leaders continuing to, to deal with that and, and to plot against the life of Jesus in John 12, 37 to, to 41, in view of the unbelief of the people, John recorded there, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be Fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah looking ahead at the coming of Jesus the coming of the Messiah, and even noting very clearly the rejection that he would receive and the hard hearts that would be against him and those who would just not see because they were blind to the truth. And that text would go on in, in verses 42 uh, and 43. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Some that saw, but they were being cautious. There was division even amongst the leaders, those who just outrightly rejected and those who cautiously accepted but weren't ready to put their whole life on the line. But Paul also noted this prophecy when he was taken to Rome as a prisoner and had opportunity to speak with Jews who were there in Rome. And on the second coming of, of Jews to hear his teaching, and there were those who were continuing to reject. Jesus, uh, Paul there brought up that, that prophecy again from Isaiah in Acts 28, 25 to 27. And we find even on that occasion, 
amongst those leaders, amongst those Jews, there was a division with regard to what it was that Paul was stating. Are we willing to see with a humble and honest heart? Remember, as John in this gospel introduced, was introducing Jesus the Messiah, in John 1, 9 to 13, there we have read, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Our connection to Christ doesn't have anything to do with a physical Jewish heritage or a physical link to Abraham, such as many of the Jews tried to place all the stock of, of, of their life but a true connection to God and, and an openness in it. And it is a, a blessing that has been open to all humanity and accepting Jesus and being connected with him, united with him in, in, through baptism in the life uh, that makes the blessing possible. And so as we consider here John's introduction, part of his introduction to Jesus as, as the Messiah, where are we in, in the picture here? Are we amongst those who are blind or are we amongst those who are blessed? Because we see Jesus as he is and therefore have been brought into this blessing of becoming children of God. Not all blind are healed physically. And that's okay. I've known people who were sight impaired that were living a very good life. And they were living also in the blessing of Christ with the hope of eternity in him. But spiritually, all who will come and who will accept, who will see from the heart, they can say, and we can say, I was blind and now I see. Providing the enlightenment of spiritual vision is still God's great work today. And so let us not approach our study of the scripture with a bias, but let us accept the proofs of God's power and the testimony of the world as we acknowledge who Jesus is and we apply to our life the truth that is in him. Let us open our eyes. Let us pray that our eyes would be opened to all the reality, all the awesomeness of Jesus Christ and all the blessings that are ours in him that we would not be deterred from any of that, but that we would truly walk on as his disciples on toward the eternity that he went to prepare for us.